Hey guys, it's Jason Snavely, certified wildlife biologist and founder and president of Drop Time Wildlife Consulting, the Drop Time Seed Company, and of course, Drop Time Podcast. Guys, I've uh, 17 years private wildlife consultant, uh, graduated from Mississippi State University, and uh, you know, one of the things I really enjoy doing is traveling the country and watching clients realize their dreams of taking a small... All right. Speaking of clients, I've got one on here with me again today. The uh, The downloads on the, what I call them, field reports have been really good. So that's good feedback that you guys enjoy those. Um, I've got a head cold, so if I sound silly, uh, that's just one excuse. I have others. So I'm sitting here with my propolis. Uh, honey is absolutely medicinal. I don't know if the two gentlemen on here with me today believe that or not, but honey is medicinal, especially propolis. If you get sore throats, this is not an ad, by the way, these people probably would not uh, support or pay me for an ad because they're from California, but it works. It's called Beekeepers Naturals. Uh, It's called propolis. It is a honey product. Uh, It's immune support. I get sore throats because I talk a lot, as many of you know, and that was a mute for a cough. Um, (laughs) Propolis is absolutely incredible. When I'm consulting or on airplanes or doing podcasts or yelling at my kids, I get sore throats. I spray this five pumps in the back of the throat, and it's incredible. Um, It's fighting this one because this is a good one, but uh, anyway, so that kind of brings me into soil health, um, I have found, if I have a head cold, this is bonus content. From the shoulders up, it doesn't matter. I can go live, do my thing. My best teener league baseball game was played when I felt like garbage from the shoulders, the neck up. So, I'm working today. Soil health. This whole segue to soil health, David Kleinschmidt, who's been on this a bunch of times, and I talk about this all the time, regenerative agriculture, soil health, what, you know, do any of these buzzwords actually make sense? To me, health is the ability to resist or survive and bounce back uh, and, and thrive basically in the presence of any type of health disruptor. It could be in your gut, it could be in your head like I have today, it could be a punch in the nose. So, when talking about soil health, I've had people say, hey, I have this bug. Uh, my plants don't all look perfect, so they're not healthy. That may or may not necessarily be true. You will still have these disruptors in your fields and in your soils, but if your soil is healthy, it will be more resistant, more resilient, and bounce back. So in nature, um, it's, it's actually normal or natural and I know this may be hard to, to believe after going through the COVID coronavirus deal here in the last few years, um, which I think all the lessons learned are actually wrong. I watch people now, um, if, if they're sick, they put a mask on and go to work or they put a mask on and go to a sporting event and it absolutely pisses me off. I want to slap them because we know that masks do not work. Yes, they're intended for sick people. But if you're sick, just stay home. You don't need to go sit in the bleachers with us, watch a football game and hack in your elbow. So I'll get off that for now. But in nature, it's absolutely normal and natural for animals. And I'm talking about above ground and below ground, microbes, white-tailed deer, turkeys, whatever, to be infected with low levels of pathogens and parasites. You may feel great right now. I guarantee you, you have pathogens and parasites inside your body. Um, Joe, I haven't haven't brought you on yet, (laughs) but you were in the woods this morning. Um, There is a pile of ticks looking for a ride for the winter right now. I know because I've been pulling them off the dogs and myself. I guarantee you, Borrelia has taken a ride, Bergdorferi, in your blood system like it has on mine. So we all have it. But health refers to your ability or fitness 
to your ability to keep these pathogens and parasites below symptomatic levels, period. So not exactly sure why I jumped on that, but I think it, it relates to soil health. If my soil is healthy, it's more resilient. The mere presence of a pathogen, believe it or not, within your body or within your soil is not the same as the presence of the disease. I have clients who are doctors, and I guarantee you there might be one or two who disagree because, well, they make money off of people, off of people's ignorance and, and misunderstanding of that. But I guarantee you the mere presence of a pathogen within your body is not the same as the presence of the disease. This is why testing is a joke unless there are symptoms and you're going to follow through with some sort of actions if you get a positive. All right, so soil health. I actually have a, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I have a guest host um, because I feel like garbage and I'm chugging water and I may have to take a pee break. And I already told my two guests today, uh, if, I, if I don't talk for a while, just keep talking. They said it will be about me and I'm good with that. Joe Schweitzer, I pulled you out of the woods this morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the podcast. You were you were on a long time ago. Yes, I think the very, 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 very first one. Yeah, yeah, back when it was still good. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. Oh, it's gotten it's gotten a lot better. <laughs> but you uh, you made a mistake this morning and uh, sent me a picture of a sunrise, which was which was badass, by the way. Um, I'm assuming beautiful, from a blind morning. or a tree or something like that, right? You were out. Yeah, you were out yeah, yeah, but in my redneck. Yep. There you go. So I said, "Hey, what are you doing today?" And you made the mistake of saying not much. I said, "Well, get out of that blind and and guest host with me." So yeah, I had to take a couple of days off because you know, as government employees, we can only carry over so many. Hey, you so said it, days. man. I did, I was not going to bring it up. <laughs> Oh, I'm very proud of that. I save all my time right now. Oh gosh. Well, our other, our other, uh, well, the, the <laughs> I know how you feel about that, but that's why <laughs> I won't, I won't get into that. I, I already just created enough emails on the whole <laughs> medical world. Um, so anyway, we also have the great Dr. Rick Haney. Rick, you awake? I am. So in the past, Rick has been on, I don't know, several times, three or four times. And I didn't realize it's been quite a while since I had Rick on because I talked to him so much. I, I, I guess I thought it was just recent, recently, um, but it was more, it, it, it was definitely time to have you back because of some conversations I've had with some people, uh, some experts also on soil health, soil testing, and all of that stuff that falls in line with that. And I, I see some of my, I don't, I don't know if they're called peers or uh, I don't know what you would call them, who are now pushing soul health and regen food plotting, which is exciting. But they're using other labs. They're using the wrong labs that don't, don't test for it. So as I say to my clients, if, you know, a lot of them won't get away from the traditional, conventional, Malik 3, university test, whatever, um, because they they feel comfortable with it and they're sold certain nonsense and BS about it. Um, but when I hear the experts, quote unquote experts, talking about it and using old extractants, um, sort of like like Rick said one time, you don't use a bag phone today. You carry around your iPhone or your Android or whatever that other crap is people have. It blows my mind that the experts don't understand how the system works and they show their cards by telling us which lab they use. And this is not a plug. I've had Lance Gunderson on in the past. Just as I looked around in the soil health regenerative ag world for an expert, for someone who I thought understood the system and was not in the tank with somebody, meaning um, somebody's hands and, and wallet was not in their pocket, I found one person, and that was Rick. Because he, he this is when he was employed by the government. <laughs> he, 
he still pulled no punches. He offered up what he thought and obviously faced a lot of resistance during that career. So I know you're retired, Rick, but it's my goal today to continue uh, kicking you and, and offering up that, that resistance that those people offered up your entire career. Excellent. <laughs> and it's my hope that Joe helps me sort of ask questions about soil testing and soil health that, you know, maybe others don't quite understand. Is that fair, Joe? That's fair. I'll, I'll try my best. I'm not going to let you off. You're not going to just sit there and not say anything. I, I could see that already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Rick, I'm going to start with this. I, I recently called... <laughs> Uh, a lab uh, what the hell it's my podcast I called Ward Labs because in my opinion they used to be a, a decent a, a good lab and you I'm not looking for your input on this this is I'm not in the field really so I can piss them off if I really wanted to piss them off I would have recorded this conversation and played blurbs but uh, my, my lawyers are busy enough right now with that so I've got some quotes <clears throat> from from this gentleman at a lab that conducts conducts a test that they called you'll love this the shat. I <laughs> honestly I always thought the shat was the standard or conventional test because it's full of shat, but they called it the soil health assessment test and I think they actually put this on their their print literature the web lab, their website and everything and then they realized that it said shat and they now they call it the SHA the soil health assessment which is not going to become common industry vernacular because it's garbage. So I called them and I told them I was a bridge builder and I didn't really understand soil. Um, and we spoke for an hour and um, it was a fun conversation. And then I got an, an email out of the blue the next day. Apparently the, gen the gentleman figured out who I was. It was, probably wasn't difficult. But anyway, so <clears throat> in, when talking about a soil test rick can can you briefly explain because i'm going to start using words like extractant can you explain sort of the um fifth grade explanation on what goes on in a soils lab when they're trying to extract nutrients to recommend a fertility program well that <clears throat> that that's a fun uh conversation because we have to kind of go back to 60, 70 years ago to where all this began. And so it was like the mid to late forties, fifties. And they started to realize, you know, that we've got to do, we, we need to do something about farming and how we do inputs. And, you know, so they started at this deal, you know, still it was right after the turn of the 20th century when they really started it. It, the, the fun part is that scientists, and, and this is a quote uh, scientists were starting to discover chemical processes that would later lead to the production and manufacturing of crop fertility products. Mm. <laughs> now, the key word there is they discovered chemical processes. You don't see where it says biological processes, which is actually how the system works. And so we went down the road of chemistry not knowing any better. And when you talk about extractants, so you, when the soil arrives at the lab, it's dried and ground to homogenize it so you know everybody's on the same playing field and the samples are comparative that way because they're all the same dryness and you know whatever and then we take that soil and mix it with a liquid of some sort and and then and then we filter that and centrifuge it and and, and in that liquid should contain the nutrients that that soil gives up and we can measure that okay so just so as that, the word sounds you are literally taking that soil applying some sort of chemical to it and physical disturbance perhaps and and pulling those nutrients into that liquid and then we have machines that measure various things okay pretty simple right okay so yeah it, it yeah now the, the trick is, is 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 right there what i just quoted chemical processes and so my thing from the very beginning was what does it, what, how does the, 
we have fields of corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, you name it, right? So what happens out in the field? What sort of chemical and biological process has happened in the field? Because you could take a soil, and I know this very well, and put it into the lab and do whatever you want to it to get whatever number you want out of there. I mean, it's not rocket appliances. It's just, just something you can do. But, but, the, but, and I never understood why we were using components of an extractant that don't exist in nature. Uh, you're, you're, getting that, that, that is, you're getting ahead as, of me. You're getting ahead of me. As a strange, you know, coming off the farm and, and a guy, one talk I gave, the guy was like, well, how'd you come up with this test? I said, well, I was a farmhand and I developed a test for farmers. So it was a farmhand developing a test for farmers. But my approach was having been on the farming side and in academia is what are we missing here? Why, why, what, what's this disconnect between the PhD professors that are, have all this intimate knowledge about how soil works and they miss only 80% of it. How did that happen? How did we just strictly go with chemistry and physics and ignore biology? We, especially when farming is a biological system. It's not a chemical system. It's a biological system. Okay. Plants are alive. Right. The soil's alive. All right. I'm so gonna why stop are you. we throwing chemistry I, 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 I Perfect. That's a great, great segue. So as I'm talking to this gentleman, here's a quote. And I want you to run with this, and I think you'll see why I, I, I walked it back a little bit. Um, hold on, let me find my card. Okay, so the SHAT, the Soil Health Assessment Test, or Soil Health Assessment, takes parts of the Haney. This is when I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. I better grab my pen. Takes parts of the Haney that we find reproducible. <laughs> and I, I, I'll, I'll keep going here. So we take... We aquion, that's that's the water extractable organic carbon and, and nitrogen. We'll get into that a little bit later. And respiration, which I agree, very good thing to take. And then he follows it up with this quote. Haney has the H3A, which is sort of, sort of, I like that, sort of a weak acid extract that didn't have good performance across <laughs> Many different soil types, and I'm not, so now I'm asking. Interesting. What kind of metrics? We're, we're, you know, I can test your forty. I'm just curious how you tested the performance of the H3A. Well, I was, that makes that's I'm finding that curious myself. But. Yeah, it just didn't have a good buffering capacity, and this is a quote still. So we went back to the original soil extractions that we historically used for all your macro and micronutrients fun i don't even know where to stop and let you talk because every quote that that came out of his mouth made me wonder if he was just trying to sell a bunch of bullshit or actually educate me i couldn't figure out if it was a genuine lack of understanding of how the system works or if i was simply a prospect at that point and it was a sales process that i had to break through and well that 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 is he was taught that I mean, he was taught that, right? That, that oh, it, well, it's, it's not buffered. The extract is not buffered. And so my, my answer to that is, does it rain malic-3, ammonium acetate, or DTPA? No, it rains water. When that water hits the soil, it mixes with organic acids that are produced by plant roots. So why are we using all these artificial extractants that are highly buffered and buffered means they're very strong because, and here's the fundamental thing I think that we all miss. The soil has a natural buffering capacity in it. It has levels of calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, all these things, right? So the soil itself is, is, is the buffer. So why would you run over and discount the buffering capacity of the soil in lieu of an extractant. So you're basically saying, if for a malic three, for example, if you get to use malic three, so you're basically saying, well, the soil's full of malic three, so that's why we're using a malic three extractant. It's obviously not full of malic three. So what? So <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Does that make any sense? It does. But that conversation, I wish I could have recorded this conversation because it would have. It would have added so much more context to this conversation, but I, 
I knew that would not be acceptable, so I didn't want to mislead anyone. But the whole reason I developed H3A was because I wanted the soil to dictate where, well, at what pH it was extracted at. In other words, if you take a pH four soil, I mean a, a, a pH eight soil, you know, high high calcium carbonate, high pH, and extract that with the H3A extractant and measure the pH of the extract to see where you're extracting it at, it'll come back like 7.7, 7, right? Yeah. Use malic 3, it comes back about 3.8. Yeah. So you're taking a pH 8 soil and extracting it at pH 3.8. Is that normal? Is that what the soil does? So am, am I pulling the right numbers out of my, my thick skull that a, the pH of the H3A is, is roughly 4.5 and the pH of malic 3 was like 2.5? Or did I make that up? Yeah. But, but, but again, the H3A, even though it's acidic, it's a weak acid. He was right about that. It is a weak acid, but see the, the pH of the soil will overcome that if it's a high pH, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's why you get low phosphorus out because that's most of that phosphorus is tied up in calcium, calcium phosphate. And so we're not ripping it out of there artificially. Makes sense. I can't tell you the times that. Malik 3 has said you don't need any phosphate in high pH soils because it takes it rips too much out that's artificial. And H3A says, no, you need 20 or 30 pounds of phosphate. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, you can get a, you know, a normal to acidic soil where Malik will get three times the phosphate out that H3A does. And and if you do the conversion, you're looking at a hundred and some pounds of 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 P205 available according to Malik, and they're still recommending phosphate, where H3A won't recommend phosphate, even though it's getting out less. So you see, it's all, none of that makes any sense. It, it's, it's, if you're not testing the soil in its natural state, then what answers are you getting? That, that, I don't understand how we got, well, I do understand how we got from here to there, because you could sell, you know, yeah. crop fertility products. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with just a couple more quotes and prove my point about this, and then I'll I'll backtrack to the pH thing and and organic matter thing because I have some listeners, uh, friends, clients, whatever, who say I want to hear more about the the details from an elementary you know description or explanation, soil organic matter and pH. That's all you hear about. Um, Fortunately, I'm not on Facebook and all that stuff. I'm, I'm back on Twitter now. But when you when you listen to people talk about food plotting and, and even agricultural uh, production ag guys talk about soil organic matter and, and how important it is, and I'm not saying it isn't, and then pH. So I'm going to come back to that. But what this what this soil health assessment that my colleagues are, are jumping on and think is the greatest thing, uh, because Ward, by the way, it seems to me since they lost Lance Gunderson, and I know Lance and, and Rick, you guys would never say this, so I'm saying it, and I don't even know if you agree with me, and I don't care, but when I talk to Lance Gunderson, the guy understands the system. When I talk to all these other people, I wish they would understand the system, but they don't. So he continues to say, our soul health assessment includes organic matter, pH, Soluble salts, and I think that's about everything. <laughs> and then, and then this next quote was funny. So it's very comprehensive, he said, <laughs> because it includes. Oh crap! So anyway, so with the, here's another quote. So the, the this is kind of lead me down the path. He says, with the Haney test, we still offer it, but you just get that you just get the H3A, water extractable carbon nitrogen, and respiration. And the soil health calculation, but we also produce a soil health calculation, which is based on the Haney test. And I thought to myself, I, I'm glad I wrote that whole thing down because that that was hor that was like listening to a lifetime or a lifelong politician talk. It, it just it went in a circle. So we we still offer the Haney test, but we don't like the Haney test, and and we've pulled out the things that work from it. And drop the things that don't. So I say, so you're telling me that you still have the necessary equipment to do the Haney test the right way? And the response was, oh, yeah. So basically what I got from that is, hey, 
the Haney test as it was developed by Haney doesn't work, but we'll take your money and say we're doing it and give you the data from an operator who probably doesn't know what they're looking at and how to report the data. So uh, if you don't want to comment on any of that, Rick, you don't have to. I just, those were quotes I wanted to get out there and read. And it, it, to me, and I am by no, I have not been through enough classes with Rick Haney teaching them, but I've been through enough to know that that's a bunch of BS. And anybody who follows that lab in their regenerative process is wasting that this stuff this stuff takes a lot of time there's a lot of gut checks there's a lot of frustration it's like a roller coaster the last thing you need to do is rely on a lab that's full of hogwash and again lance gunderson's lab does not sponsor me they don't pay me and when i send my samples in i'm happy to show i have an account there and i pay for them i'm happy to show you that and prove that but in my opinion if you're truly wanting to track this has turned into a, a Regen Ag Lab ad. <clears throat> you think Lance will send me any money for this? I don't know. I'm going to ask him later. Yeah. Um, but it's it's true. You know, it it cracks me up. There's there's a web TV guy who I probably mentioned way too much who used to use another lab that didn't even know how to study. Maybe they had Solvita paddles, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but now they're transitioning to a lab that that needs more exposure because their financials are struggling so they start to pay people as a sponsor to get the word out and to get exposure and to exploit another industry because again their financials suck um lance doesn't do that because the last i talked to lance he's so damn busy he can't keep up and his lab is growing exponentially so let's go back to this um, let's do the let's do the pH first, Rick, because I get that question a lot. They want to hear more about it. Um, you know, we talk about fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer, and, and regen wildlife food plotting, but we never talk about pH. And you know, basically, what I told well, you know what go I was just like you. I'm gonna sit back and take a, a couple squirts of of Beekeepers Natural Propolis. I'm just full of plugs today. Yeah, you are. This shit works. Go ahead. Fire. pH. Do do we get, I, I'll, all right, I'll set it up by saying this. Since I started and Joe, I, say something, Joe. <laughs> I'm here. I'm listening, man. I'm, I, I, I'm I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I know. That's cool. I, I think you'll agree with me here on this. Um since I started this, and I've got some 17 and 18. That's 2017, 2018 um tests from the original Haney lab sitting here. I have not put any lime on my fields, and they continue to increase in pH. Nor did I. There you go. Well, and the and the reason for that is is synthetic. Well, you know, for the fertilizers that we put on basically produce acidity, just in the, the the nature of how they're they're done, and and so. When you get away from that, that you should see that incremental increase in pH back to its natural state. Now, you're not going to take a pH 6 soil and move it to a pH 8 soil in 10 years, you know, by not putting fertilizer. That's just not how that works. But the soil will find its natural, its natural state uh, once we put, quit putting artificial uh, inputs on it. So that's what you should see. And, 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 and pH is very valuable. Uh, test because it gives you some idea uh, where you're at as far as you know nutrient availability and these kind of things and but p and ph is great what i really like is the h3a calcium iron aluminum ratio because that tells me more about ph than just ph okay don't say too much so, Rick. don't say too much they don't pay for this <laughs> oh no, okay I, I won't but <laughs> it, that was one of the things that really jumped out at me when I was developing the extractor. And it, it was like, wow, well, well, wait, look at that. So uh, you take a Malik 3 test. They they do, you know, phosphate. You use ammonia, they use ammonium acetate, a lot of labs for, for calcium and, and potassium. and it, But you can use Malik for all those three things too. But your calcium and iron, they don't measure aluminum, which you can with H3A. And so you miss you miss half of that equation by 
just using the standard test, using malic or ammonium acetate, as far as phosphate, calcium, iron, and aluminum. Those three, those three things are really related to phosphate. Yeah. So it gives you better insight into, uh, do I need lime? Do I not need lime? Why is my phosphate availability low compared to this soil or that soil with the same pH? That will help answer that question. And that's what's valuable is if you get, have more insight into how your soil functions uh, you know, out in the field, then you can make better management decisions based off that information instead of just, oh, your pH is 7. Well, okay. What does that mean? Right, so I want to reinforce the fact when when people say like like he mentioned that we do we add in the pH it, that that tells me correct me if I'm wrong maybe I'm looking at this too uh, I don't know too much on the surface I, I I listen to people and ask stupid questions because I'm really good at that um, it's natural but when he tells me <clears throat> that he also throws in and adds the pH. Calcium, aluminum, and iron, the, that relationship, as you alluded to, the, the Haney test, even before Lance started putting on, or Regen Ag Lab started putting on the pH, the Haney test still gave us all the information we needed to know about the pH. Yeah. I, so when I had the lab at USDA, I didn't measure organic matter or pH because, you know, I didn't really care. We were looking at something else. And, and I'm glad that. And pretty much every standard test across the country is going to give you pH and organic matter on the standard test. That's just, you know, common because they're not that hard to measure. And, but I didn't really care about pH because I had calcium, iron, aluminum from H3A. Right. So I was looking at the drivers of pH. Yeah. So I didn't have to worry too much about pH. But since I've been working with Lance, you know, now I have organic matter, pH, and all the handy test information, which really helps tie everything together and actually is actually i'm a very open-minded person and it's actually <laughs> reinforced that you know wow that really does you know now that i have ph and organic matter it's like wow look at that it yeah. really does reinforce that and so that's been fun to, to to look at and realize okay so i know you're not a microbiologist you're a soil scientist but can you as far as the ph before we move on can you do you have any input or anything to say about the microbes changing? Do the microbes change the pH around the roots in that rhizosphere where the game is played? Or do the plants change or amend or whatever you want to call it, the pH <laughs> to make? You asked the, my question. You're asking. No, that's a, that's Go a ahead then, point. Joe, you ask it. I'm going to. Put my feet you up. Got, you got it. You got it. All right. So, so, because, you know, in nature, everything's simple, right? There's always one answer for uh, it. Yeah. See, so that's the thing. That's the <laughs> fundamental thing. <laughs> nature is unbelievably complicated. We're trying to, to capture what it's doing with pretty simplistic tests. And just like the question you just posed, what a fascinating question. So, you have pH in the soil that's inherent in the soil, right? As soon as you put a growing plant in there, and get a bunch of microbes, get a bunch of plants farming a bunch of microbes and bring in certain species in, especially when you increase diversity. Now, what, have you, what, what are you looking at? You know, it's like looking at a bulk soil sample with nothing growing on it for a year versus one that's got, you know, high diversity cover crops and, and you know, whatever, biologicals or whatever you want to put on there. You've got two wildly different systems. So, and, but the, to answer your question, it does... The plant roots uh, drop out organic acids, which is what H3A is based on. And the organic acids in that extraction, are they all, is that the end all? No. There's a whole lot of other organic acids that are come into play that you could spend a lifetime researching and never make any progress to help a farmer. So that's why I ended up with the three most prevalent ones that I put in there to just get, you know, get our foot in the door. And so, yeah. Yes, they changed the pH around the rhizosphere. There's been lots of papers about that. Now, is it a drastic change? Is it highly buffered? No. It's, it only has to impact just a little bit around the soil and to, to make nutrients to where plants can get it. Plants have mechanisms to get at nutrients regardless of the pH. You're going to have different mechanisms in place at high pH versus low pH, but they obviously have 
uh, a way to do that. And people are like, well, you can't prove that. It's like, well, oh, bullshit. Plants have survived for millions of years. Yeah, so their life, your their, their life depends on it. They have to. Yeah, their, their R&D department is really sophisticated and an unlimited budget. And so, we sure as hell aren't helping them. So they've, they're clearly doing it on their own. No, we're actually inhibiting the process. And, and, and one of the things that I wish so badly that, that would have been done is that soil scientists would have looked at the soil as a living, breathing entity and that plants are alive and conducting certain things. And if we'd have gone down that road in research as opposed to, well, hell, let's rip out as much shit as we can and throw as much crap back on it and call it good because, you know, we're have domain over there. You know, it's like we have... It's like we're going to build a we're going to build a rocket to go to the moon uh, with no fundamental understanding of how a rocket works. Let's do that. Yeah, I don't think you'd survive that one well. Yeah, but, yeah. the 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 bane of science is nobody would make money off of that. I mean, you. Well, I better not go down that rabbit hole too far. But yeah, you you you. Well, got, but that's if, not to say that's not to say though that there aren't things out there we have yet to discover that we could do that would help. I mean, we, we just are ignorant of that because we haven't gone down that road. Now, you're seeing a lot of products on the market, biological products that yeah. claim this and that and this and that and this and that. And I'm not going to say that, you know, that's all crap. We don't know. Yeah, There's so many things out there we don't comprehend yet about how this system works. It's frightening. But the first step to actually understanding a piece of how that works is well, let's look at, you know, what is the chemistry in soil when a plant root's actively growing in it? So that's going to be similar to what H3A is, not Malik 3. What's, what are these microbes doing? If, if you've got a cover crop planted here versus a bare soil, what are they doing? How does that impact? And we can see that in soil respiration. We can see that water extractable organic carbon. So now we're getting a little window into, wow, look at this is that's going on. In my... Go-to story is you've got two soils with pH or organic matter content of 3%, and one's got a soil health score of 25, and the other's got one of 12. Why? Because they look exactly the same by organic matter or pH or standard uh, nutrient analysis. They look the same, but they're wildly different. And we're going to treat those two the same is not correct. You know, you're going to get nutrients from the natural system that we need to account for so that we don't have to over apply fertilizer products so and this is the whole crux of it yes exactly and there's another rabbit hole but I, i'll i'll that the whole ph thing just to drive that home for people is that soil ph will absolutely self-correct if you are following those soil health i hate to keep bringing up the soil health principles all the time if you're essentially farming like nature wants you to farm or or closer to that than what we have done in the past and i've had guys say well mine's not changing but they're still managing a dysfunctional degraded conventional system um you know in one form or another so if you change that you absolutely will see as joe said he has not the, the, i haven't said much about joe it's been a long time since he's been on <laughs> um, it, for, for anybody who's listening I, I, there was a podcast shared with me not too long ago where the guy essentially I can't even remember his name which is great about having a, a poor short term memory essentially discounted regenerative agriculture and, and soil he didn't really use soil health um, didn't talk about biology at all actually but said that no tilling no tilling in his mind was regenerative ag and soil health that's sort of his belief but it it kind of works, kind of doesn't work. He's not saying it doesn't work, but it really doesn't work in this application and for everyone. And it was a, a whole other word salad, like listening to our vice president talk, um, or either of them, actually. <laughs> and when you boil it down, it goes back to not understanding how the system works. You can't say that this approach doesn't work. If you don't understand the system, you're not playing by the rules. You're not you're not following the proper rules. So, I guess uh, I well, want. If, if you ahead. think about any give, any given field, let's say, and, and I have many examples of this. I used to farm this way. It, it, that's monoculture wheat. This this dirt has never seen anything but monoculture wheat and, and 
quote unquote weeds, right? That weren't there very long because it was plowed. Yeah. So you have farmed by your management decisions, you have farmed for the microorganisms that can only respond to wheat, right? That's very limited. It's, it's like saying, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, eat three times a day and eat rice at, at, at all three settings because, yes. you know, that's all I need. That, that, and we farm that way as opposed to let's put this diverse cover crop in there and get all this diversity of microorganisms that can fill all these different niches to make nutrient pathways open and, and be more efficient with the nutrients that are in the soil. I mean, this is that's just a no-brainer to me. Yes. Versus that- no-till. I, and I've said many times I would rather see – a farmer conventionally till soil but use cover crops then no till without cover crops because you 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 it's going to take forever to change the system if you just go to no till and that's it and you keep on fertilizing and you keep on yeah. not putting crop rotation or, or diversity of plants and you're you, you know yeah we've, like we've talked grow, about you want to grow deer antlers in, in 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 good deer antlers in five years or in 30 yeah you know, exactly. We've talked about this resetting the system and tillage versus chemicals a million times, Rick. And I and I had this conversation sort of that there's a difference between a conversation I have with you about should we just rip it up, till this thing and and reset the system? Uh, there's it's a difference resetting, yeah. Yeah, there's a difference between the context of you and I talking about that and me and a client talking about that. And it depends at what point the client is at in this continuum as well, which is what I'm learning from actually doing this in the field consulting with clients. But this particular client in Iowa has a uh, just bought, I don't know, let's say this tract is 200 acres or 300 acres. And it has been conventionally destroyed for generations. It's Iowa, right? Probably some of the highest uh, income producing ag land in the state. And it, and to me, it looks like the top of my desk. Um, and, and he also owns properties in, others, in another state where he has been working with me uh, pretty much since the beginning on regen. So that this topic of conversation comes up should I should we just plow this and reset the clock? And that that's kind of what what you're referring to is the microbial like, like when a client starts a new process, let's just say South Carolina or Georgia, and they're frustrated at year two, which they all are, because they can't get plants to grow. And obviously the moisture hasn't come, and that's you know without moisture the game doesn't doesn't go on. But what they don't understand is for generations those microbes have been farmed. So there's, it's kind of like in your gut, like you said, if you eat McDonald's every day, you're not going to get sick because your gut, your gut biome is developed around consuming McDonald's. You're going to crave McDonald's and you're going to want it. If you never eat McDonald's, you probably don't crave it. And when you, you what's that? It'll probably make you sick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, and when you eat it, it gives you the shits. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of simple, but, the same thing happens in the soil. The, the microbiome of the soil, the biome of the soil is very much the same. If your gut's not right, your health's not right. If your soil's not right, and this goes back to the origin of my story in soil health and my health, but you have to change. You have to, when you say farm that microbial population, you're changing that microbial population. So you're in there year one, year two, and you used, to, you used like wheat, for instance, in a cropping system, or some of these guys are planting, you know, this, this, this highly stoloniferous, super improved clover from Pennington created in some lab somewhere. And, and they have formed a certain set or subset of microbes that, that work symbiotically with that plant. So it takes a little bit of time. There's never just one thing. It's not just the lack of rain or I should say the lack of consistent rain. There, there's so much more going on. So yeah, that, that whole microbial shift has been really kind of cool for me to see in the soil tests as I've gone down this continuum. Yeah, and that's just one of the indicators that is so important because it's one thing to sit there and, and, and try regenerative practices and do all these things and you know, you're, you're sitting there staring at soil. 
is the soil jumping out of the ground going, boy, patting you on the back going, hey, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Well, no. You have to have some sort of indication. And it's so valuable to be able to see from a soil test, we're headed in the right direction. That's, that's just priceless stuff. Because otherwise, you just want to get frustrated and quit and give up. Yeah. But once it, the soil test is actually designed to get you over the hump. Because once you get to a certain place, I don't, you know, you don't really need the soil test all that much. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Well, it's true. Oh boy, that's that's exactly what I did because I haven't done a soil test in two or three years because my last soil test haven't have improved what we saw. And Jason, you saw that have improved. My soils have improved that I could put anything in the ground right now and it grows. It it grows like wild. And, and yeah. soil just loves it. Yeah, if if well, there was a pl- go ahead, Rick. When I first went to work for Lance, he said, "You know, I hope we're unemployed in ten years." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I hope that we get enough people moving in the right direction that they don't have to that this is a that we don't have to soil test anymore." That, that you know, and that's the attitude we're looking for right there. Yeah, it's like in because that's a service mindset. We actually want to help farmers overcome that hump and head down the right direction that's you know that's what the test is designed to do you know that's where we want to be that's where we want to get to and the other is just what the continuation of the treadmill right the squirrel and the fertilizer and the inputs and the crappy soil test and blah 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 that don't tell you anything and i had a, I had a conversation with a guy the other day he's like well you know I'm getting a ten dollar soil test. It's like, yeah, you're getting ten dollar uh, worth of results too. He's like, what do you mean? I said, so, so he said, well, my nitrates, you know, ten pounds. It's like, okay. And what you know, what's the microbial activity? What 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 do they think of the carbon you're putting in there? You know, on 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 on. Well, it doesn't have to give you that. It's like, right. And that's why it's a ten dollar test. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't you think. What, so, it, so the iPhone is it? You know, can you buy a ten dollar iPhone? No. You know, so quality. You just you know you don't see a lot of quality products in the world in any business that's cheap, do you? So you know y'all have to pay a little bit for quality, and so that you know that's and, just and, the way that it works. And proof that that works in nature as well. Um, is is in chi- anybody who raises chickens the right way my daughter and i raise chickens we try it what we think is the right way and uh when you break open a chicken egg from the store that get well that, it's funny it's it's entertaining because they used to be like what i don't know you could go I, my mother-in-law would tell me you go buy chicken eggs for i don't know what two bucks a dozen or whatever and it looked nasty it's not something i would ever put in my body you crack it easily Yellow yolks, which should not be yellow, they should be bright orange, full of phytotoxins. And the snot runs across your pan. That should not happen. It should stay solid in a in a in a relative small circle. And just looking at that, it's because it's so sensitive. You can start with a chicken's diet immediately and see the output of those eggs. But Joe, I wanted to go back to the fact that. So, so you, Joe is one of those who, um, he listens to everything that not just I say, but that, that we say when, when he, his goal is regenerative food plotting. His goal was to cut, cut synthetic fertilizers. And I, I, I'm laughing because Joe was one of my clients who was buying a bunch of fertilizer and he was one of those guys that I think my fertilizer, quote unquote, I don't know, he really wasn't a salesman, but he, he when, when he found out I was headed down this path quite a while ago, he started calling some of my clients and back soliciting and, and telling them that their deer populations were going to collapse and that all this hard work that we had put into it, I'm damn near quoting it, all this hard work that we had put into it was that that Snavely was going to destroy it. And I always say, I remember walking out of the hardware store and and finally answering his his phone call because he was calling me and calling me. I thought he needed me. I thought he was under a tractor or something. Calling me, calling, I better answer this. What are you doing? Right, Joe? Right, correct. Yep. (laughs) 
<laughs> but you have followed. It's funny, I just laugh at it now. <laughs> yeah, it it is kind of funny to. Th- but then you look at the the amount of money that we were spending on that crap, and the fact that like Rick just brought up, it's acidic. So now it's like the dog chasing his tail, and and now you need more lime, and it's this vicious cycle of complete dysfunction. But when I look at your program, and one of the reasons I'd like to have you on is because. I know you're not just blowing smoke and you're not a big talker either of all the people no. who should be talking. It, <laughs> it would be you, but you have followed nature's image of how to grow things almost perfectly. And I thank you. There, I there thank are you. times. Well, yeah, you're a lot of help. We, we, we text, we text and listening to uh, Dr. H there too. Yeah. So it's not, it's not only me. It's, it's a team. But, when, when, you know, I don't even know how to say this without, some people, you know, tend to give up and they expect this to be simple. And, you know, you and I, when we started with, with Rick, um, both of us yeah. being competitive in nature, we said, okay, right. we're not too far apart. What are we, an hour apart, our, our farms, right. I guess? Let's, yeah. let's. Let's see. And our places in Florida are less than an hour apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the cocktail opportunities are high. Most but, definitely. But we said, okay, let's compete and let's see who can get the highest, you know, soul health score calculation. Let's I see remember who, that. Yeah, I let's remember. see. What do you mean you remember that? No, we, we, haven't, we haven't stopped that yet. We're both just busting our asses <laughs> to try to get to that point where – <laughs> our lowest soil health calculation is higher than the other guys, right? And and that kind of makes it fun, to be honest with you. But there are times where you would send me a picture or we would talk about the management of a particular field. And I wish Rick could see all this because it fits right into what he's saying. And it's I don't want to say it's harder, but it is harder to do in a production ag setting where, man, that's how you make money, right? That's how you pay the bills and put the kids through college and pay the mortgage, Whereas most of us are not doing that in the wildlife food plotting world. So we can get more aggressive and ask the what ifs, why nots, and how about we try this. But there are times where I get so pissed at you because you take the time to do it right and follow the principles and you'll be like, you'll send me a picture. Hey, look at this. And I'm like, dang, I don't want to say this, but that looks better than any plot I have right now. And then we start, oh, obviously, two different farms, right? Two right. completely different circumstances. Right. Yours was raped and pillaged as a golf course, which is an absolute sin. <laughs> yeah. I know you're a golfer, but... Yeah, yeah. But, but you took a golf course and said, let's, let's regenerate this thing into a, you know, a, a wildlife sanctuary that's also great for hunting. So yeah. I guess the end question is, in cutting synthetics out, has the deer population crashed? Uh, absolutely not. It probably tripled, actually. <laughs> so I and thought of you. In it? What are we in? Six, six, seven years we're going into? This? Yeah, something I can't like even that. Remember? I think this Doesn't is matter, your but... seventh season. But I thought about you yeah. yesterday as I was watching some of my fields, which really means I'm watching for hunters because this time of year pisses me off. Between here we go, Rick. I'm getting on my soapbox. Hey. Here we go. I'm giving. I'm just giving Rick a break. The professor needed a break. He's probably taking a <laughs> leak right now. So that period of time, this is what the Pennsylvania Game Commission either doesn't understand or just doesn't care about. But that period of time between Halloween and Thanksgiving, or shortly thereafter, the poachers and trespassers. And by the way, if you trespass on property you don't own, don't pay taxes on, and your your name's not on the deed, you're a poacher. It's all the same. They're out in full force and they're killing mature bucks. They're not shooting the two and three year olds running and yearlings running all over the place for the most part. They're killing mature right. bucks. I know this because I stake out every year all night long, along with the assistance of some others. The poaching problem is a huge problem, but state agencies are sending their employees all over the place testing for chronic wasting disease, which I'm not saying is a complete waste of time, but they need to refocus because they're not moving the needle at all on chronic wasting disease. Some people are, they're not. So as I'm sitting out there watching deer, Joe, or acting like I'm watching mm-hmm. deer, and I, I love watching deer. I, I love absolutely. That's the my my first passion. And an elderly yeah. lady stops and says, "Are you seeing any deer?" Now this is after yeah. one one fella in his mid twenties, you know, crew cut, big dip in his mouth. 
you know, big jacked up pickup um, like mine rolls up and, and he looks at me, he says, how big is he? And I said, just keep going. I'm looking at my land, keep going. He said, well, I'm looking for big bucks. I said, then go home and watch Michael Waddell's TV show. You can see big bucks there that you can't kill either because you can't kill them here. So just move on. That went well. So this elderly lady rolls up and she's just sweet as can be. She's like, can't, are you seeing any, any deer? And I said, yes, ma'am. I'm just watching my land. And she said, you know, I got to tell you, I drive, I don't live on this road, which I already knew. She said, I drive home every night this way just to watch the deer. And I I thought that that's kind of cool. Like that, to me, that's an observation that, you know what, there's white-tailed deer. And and if you listen to, you know, soccer moms and state agencies and foresters, et cetera, there's too many white-tailed deer everywhere, but yet we have chronic wasting disease. They say that's basically increased in prevalence that it is annihilating the herd. So I thought that was kind of cool that she could go any country road home, but she opted to go this route just to see the deer. And that that's kind of how your place is. And I think both of us ha- have struggled more so with keeping mature bucks in recent years because yes. we do this, right? They, the, the first five years I owned my, my farm, I did not hunt it. We, uh, I met a state trooper who was phenomenal. There are good ones out there, and there are bad ones out there, yes. The game commission was useless at that point, the, the local conservation officer. Since we have a great new young one who's energetic, but that guy just needed to move on, and he has. Um, but as time goes on and you start to talk about this and people see this, the sportsmen, the hunters, yes, the, sometimes even good people get out there and they sneak on and they kill mature bucks at night with spotlights. Um, spotlighting should be outlawed. Why it is not is, is well, I know why. So I, I guess, Joe, we, we've both gone, kind of gone through that, but has, has or you just said the deer numbers have tripled. What, what, what do you attribute that to? Uh, I would say I would attribute that to uh, I guess two or three several several different points. One, uh, actually, you know, we have better food for them now. Uh, and I, I think I I texted you last night when I was up in my blind, and I, I think I told you like I planted buckwheat into your uh, fall fuel, and I I put my fences up. But the amazing thing is, I've had that fence down for three weeks and I'm, I'm, I was going there last night thinking they're going to destroy all that buckwheat by the time I even get in there. And it wasn't touched, but what was touched was your fall fuel. So you came back. Well, I don't, that doesn't surprise me because of diversity of, of, of your, of your seed. And so, you know, sitting there, I'm like, well, that makes sense to me. You know, it's like me going to a buffet with lots of tail and shrimp and steak and everything. And uh, what am I going to get a salad or am I going to get the steak or shrimp? So that's, that's number one. Number two, uh, we, we, we haven't shot uh, dough in, in several years. Uh, my son wants to, I'm trying to just build up a nice, nice herd to, uh, to continue the trend. And, and that's, that's what I'm saying. There, there's, uh, we, you know, this past winter was pretty, pretty bad for us, as you know, but coming out of going into March, April, I, you know, I saw a herd that looked very healthy and, and now, you know, throughout the summer, it, it, they're, they're just amazing. Some of them, you know, remind me of some small cows, actually, some of my, some of the uh, herd that I'm seeing. Yeah. So those, those two, two main points, uh, I would say help, help triple the population. Yeah. And, and you got to that point now where aging bucks based on body uh, right. composition but right. body traits right. has become a little bit more difficult where we see three-year-olds that look like four-year-olds and two-year-olds that look like three-year-olds and that i think Correct. is a a phenotypic expression of what's going on and, and maternal effects and a lot of other things so i know some of my former professors listen to this podcast um and they're going wait a minute snavely's telling his clients not to shoot those hmm sounds I didn't like say that that's my, that's my, that's my preference. <laughs> so, uh, all right, let me ask you this then. If, if you're not killing a lot of does, 
Um, obviously, the vans, the, the minivans that fly by your place do. Uh, I know they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so those are dying. Don't, don't misunderstand that. And neighbors, we're, listen, we're in Pennsylvania. So, you know, so neighbors are killing those for sure. So there is mortality right. there, period. Are right. you seeing recruitment rates? In other words, are you seeing does without fawns or do you see, you know, most of your does have two fawns or whatever? Most of my does within the last two or three years, I'm seeing, uh, uh, twins coming, coming, uh, out in spring yeah. or, uh, you know, when they're born, uh, there this year we had a couple triplets. Unfortunately, some have gotten, uh, hit by the minivan soccer mom <laughs> and you could cut, edit that out if you want to don't matter nope. to me nope. but but uh yeah uh yeah most definitely to, uh twins are i'm seeing more twins and uh just healthier healthier deer all around i you know <laughs> some of the some of these deer are, are just bigger than i've ever seen you know how much <clears throat> how much fertilizer have you used in the last seven years uh, that would be a zero point zero. <laughs> I like Don't the accuracy it. of that statement. <laughs> yeah, he kind of has some so let me, let engineering me, in his I'm background. Gonna, I, I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, some some of the land was old golf course. Some of it was agriculture. Uh, a lot of history back in the 1800s. But one particular hole, and we call it food plot number six, Jason. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was uh, that was a hole my father not built out of it was pure woods pure woods he came they came in they timbered all the land or timbered all the hole and they brought in river river rock and river mud and everything else and it was a beautiful beautiful hole now when the golf course closed you know called you we're going to make some food plots uh five years ago my mother-in-law i was so excited that day I, by the way I so <laughs> my mother-in-law came up and I took her for a tour uh, when we started doing this uh, regenerative thing. And uh, we went to number six and she said, you know, you're never going to grow anything out of here. They yeah. always had trouble growing grass. I remember that. Because <laughs> it's only two inches of, of, so of dirt. I said, well, I'm going to give it a couple of years. Well, you're never going to do it. Well, I took her up there last Sunday without growing anything on that hole except for, you know, uh, cover crops. I have, I have about five to six inches of soil right now into it before I hit rock, before I hit ledge. So within what, five or six, seven years, I, I've, I've grown four inches of, of topsoil. Right. And then now, now I'll point out that's a relatively small area. So acreage wise, you're talking about how much that you're managing this way right there. Uh, food, food. Oh, where on that, <clears throat> that, hole? that particular number hole, six. number six. Yeah. Uh, I would say that's <laughs> about an acre and a half. Yeah. So, so again, the people are going all oh, five or six inches in seven years or whatever. That's impossible. Understand we are super fo hyper focused on a roughly one or whatever, two acre, you know, fairway green right. or, <laughs> right. or tea, right. right? Right. And that was, you know, uh, you know, for golf courses, they sprayed a lot of chemicals. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you want fairway grass and everything and, and, but uh, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, that hole right there because I haven't, I haven't really grown anything to shoot deer on it and I'm going to give it three more years. I want it to soil build up again, just keep putting those cover crops in well, rolling them over and planting more. Yeah. But I think within nine years, uh, that's going to be a beautiful plot back there. Yeah. Well, and think about the other thing that you've done there. You know, we we're like, Oh, this soil's degraded. It's, 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 you can't do nothing with it. Just like that lady was saying right and but soils are resilient and so if you make a management change and stick with it uh, look at what happened exactly i mean that's exactly. a huge that's a huge thing that I mean, we we, we take these, these were overlook. fairways i mean there was so much chemical put on them every single day of its life for for 22 years you know, and, you know, during, during the winter, uh, before the winter would set in, they would put chemical on so they wouldn't get snow mold back in, back in, in the following right. spring. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's a hell of a research plot right there because you went from a completely degraded system that was, that was, you know, wiped out by 
uh, you know, human chemistry. Right. To, I'm going to back off and, and try to help. It's the whole thing. Are you helping or hurting nature? Are you, you know, which is it? You, you, you really get one of the or the other. And I mean, to me, that's, that is rock solid research data right there. Right. And, and again, it's only an acre and a half. I'm not, and I'm a stupid food plotter. I mean, I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing it. You know, I have a regular job, which I'll retire in 18 months, but, uh, you know, I'm just doing it to grow bigger, you know, to, to grow deer. That's it. It's a stupid thing if you want to call it that way, but it's what I enjoy doing. You know, but look at it. But look at how valuable that is. Oh, well, that can't be done. I mean, that, that aren't those the, some of the greatest words in the human language? Oh, that can't be. Done. It is. And, oh, you can't and do it that. Was, <laughs> and it was my mother-in-law, so you know, you, you have to even prove better. It. That's, that's even better. <laughs> Is this so, what we talk about, Jason? Now, yeah, go just, ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just. He might. He might have went to the bathroom. <laughs> no, I did. I thought about it, but I'm just sitting back with my feet up, trying to figure out. I'm thinking about a Moscow Mule today for lunch. Um, I, I like the Jamaican Mule swerve on it with the dark rum. So it just. Oh shit! We're still recording. <laughs> yeah, but but I I want to drive this point home as hard as as we can because. It in, in, as with science as a god, right? Yeah. What the information you just shared is of no value. Yes. Right. Because it wasn't right. replicated. It wasn't blah 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 blah. Nonsense. What about the peer I, review? I don't, care if, I don't care if it's just an acre. Nature. We we had this little garden plot back here, at, at our place, and you know it's a little bitty. It's it's like you know like seventy by seventy, and. Liz had her chickens over there. We put hay in there. And those chickens would scratch around, and then they'd crap all over it. We'd take all that hay. Yeah, I mean, we call it sweet mountain chicken dirt, and <laughs> we put that on the garden. And and the garden had cover crops in it. And what a transformative change! So I'm not saying that we're going to start doing. You're going to do that on a thousand acres, but the point is so important is that if you make a management change. You can start to turn the system around. You that, can. That is so important. One hundred percent. Sweet. That's what? all. I, Sweet mountain chicken dirt. <laughs> I don't know how you came up with that, but it was awesome. <laughs> I took it to the lab and tested it. It was like, oh my god, this is, I think, one of the highest soil health scores I've ever seen. Yes, yeah, so I got a good story. Story on chicken, chicken shit. So I noticed in our chicken, and we have about. Uh, what is it? Three quarters of an acre. So they're not technically free range, but we have, you know, ospreys, eagles, hawks, fox, coyotes, yeah, that's bears, free range. all that stuff. So three quarters of an acre, less than a dozen chickens at all times. Uh, right now we're running out of a herd of seven. And <laughs> I noticed that where these chickens hang out in, you know, like if it's, if it's exposed soil for whatever reason, uh, of course they love dusting and that getting rid of the parasites, et cetera. But when they hang out there, that soil, it gets better so much faster. And, and it's generally still exposed and naked, but you see earthworm castings and the chickens are scratching in it and pooping in it. And the wife bought, what is it? The, I don't know if it's who's, who's tops. You know, you buy the bag top soil at, uh, at Lowe's, Home Depot, or wherever you get it. And I absolutely hate that stuff. It's, it just disgusts me. Um, and the one day I stuck a, the ST one, our soil talker unit, um, into it because I was like, Hey, they, you know, we're, we're paying a premium for this, this great topsoil. That's, you know, dark, rich, black smells like chemicals. Um, I wonder what, what kind of life is in it. And it wasn't real good. Needless to say, I test the, uh, the chicken, uh, run or whatever. And the, the, the microbes love what the chickens have done. So, <clears throat> my wife's like, Hey, can you repot this or get me some soil for this? And I'm like, yep. Headed to the chicken coop. I'll dig up a hole. No, just get that stuff in the bag. I said, no, that, that, no, you could put a plant that you hate in that, but it is the best potting soil you could possibly find. So that, there's a, there's a plug for chickens. I don't know why I told that story <laughs> other than it's a micro habitat on this great earth <clears throat> of exposed soil. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Animal impact. It's still exposed and they get to work on it. And before you know it, there's, you know, little, 
uh, little plants popping up all over the place. And it's well, and you also said that they go out there and they scratch around. They don't pull a, a, a ripper through it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Point taken. Yeah. They don't kill it. <laughs> Point well taken. So <clears throat> the, uh, the head cold's getting to me. The, the H three, a couple squirts from the, the propolis by beekeepers naturals. They better send me a check. <laughs> Um, the, the comment that this gentleman made, I like going back to these comments. Um, and we've gone over an hour and 10. So if you guys are bored, just hang up and leave. But I wanted to entertain this one. He says the weak acid extractants were supposed to be based on root exudates. I thought that was funny, right? The H3A, the, the weak extractants were supposed to be based on root exudates. I'm pretty sure they were, they are right. Not yep. supposed to be, um, However, some of the historically used extractants, uh, I'm assuming he's talking about what? Ammonium nitrate, ammonium fluoride, nitric acid, I don't know, uh, were similarly based on what plants could extract out in plant available form. Huh? So, so what yeah. he was saying was is, is some of the historically used extractants, I, I, I guess assuming is a bad thing to do, but I'm thinking Malik 3, right? Because they tend to be... I was told that those were better than Malik 2 or 1 or all the other 10,000 extractions. Well, it's just they, they did more stuff with Malik 3 than Malik 1. Malik 1 is not quite as harsh. Uh, but the fun part about all that is when or, when plant roots dump organic acids into the soil, That's you've heard the word organic before, right? That means carbon-based, right? Yeah. So you can, it'll temporarily change the pH of the soil right there around the root. And, and as soon as the plant gets done what it's done, now you've got an organic acid laying there. And guess what that is? Candy for microbes. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's go pour some uh, some malic 3 on the soil and see what happens to the microbial population. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that that's just not an argument. I mean, it's like the, the natural system... They dump organic acids to do these things, and then it becomes food for microbes, which further enhances their root plant, you know, yeah. microbe interaction versus, oh, well, no, you've got to use this malic 3. Well, go dump some malic 3 on the soil and test respiration because I've done that. And guess what? There isn't any. Hmm. So what are you actually extracting? I mean, this goes back to that principle of nature and how nature works and functions. And and you know, if, if we're not going to mimic it, then what are we looking at? Yeah, you know. You, and you stole thing. you just stole my thunder. By the way, I had a, I had a line he wrote down here. It turns out that these organic acids are excellent food sources for microbes, and the soil yeah. pH returns to a normal pH. So you right. stole my thunder on that one. Um, and you're not you're not altering the buffering capacity. I mean, it's just on and on and on. It, it's just. You know, but that's what they were taught is that this is what you do. You know, Malik 3 came out in 1983, which is very, very current because management hasn't changed, tillage hasn't changed, crop types haven't changed, you know, genetics haven't changed. So let's keep using a 50 year old, 40 year old extractant that was never right to begin with. Yeah, I was big on Michael Jackson in 83. <clears throat> Still big on. In fact, when I'm drinking my mule today, I think I'm going to play Beat It in Thriller. That's a good idea. It's going to be a great day for me. Billy Jean. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So what else did I want to, something else that made me angry with, maybe not. I think we covered most of my notes. So, um, why, why do you talk about the water extract then? I'll just hit that real quick. So, well, again, I mean, it rains water. And so, no, is that, is that, did, do you have science behind that? No, it's, 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 what do they call it? Anecdotal. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have, re, we don't have peer review research to see that rains water, but again, yeah. that's why we didn't do organic <laughs> matter when I had the lab. It's like, well, I don't need to know what the organic matter is. Mm -hmm. I need to know what, what the food source is. Organic matter is, is a huge pool of carbon. I guess we didn't you know, talk about solar organic matter. I said I was going to come back to it, so go anywhere ahead. Anywhere from, you know, 
5,000 to, to 70,000 pounds of carbon in, in a given soil, depending on the, you know, organic matter content. And that's fine. But that's, the soil microbes are not chewing on 70,000 pounds of carbon at a time. They're, they're not. <laughs> they're chewing on the water-soluble carbon. That's their food source. And so that's why we wanted to extract the soil with water and then run organic carbon on it. Because that's the stuff that when it rains, the microbes swim through that and they find those carbon molecules and that's what they're chewing on. And so we started looking at what, you know, and then respiration doesn't line up that great with organic matter. It, I mean, it's related, but not that great. But when we started looking at respiration versus water extracting organic carbon, it's like, aha, that's the food. Yeah. Which is also related to organic nitrogen, water extractable, which is that nitrogen pool we're not accounting for versus uh, fertilizer recommendations. And it's a huge, sometimes a huge pool. It could be 60, 70 pounds of nitrogen you don't need. And so th these things all just kind of work together and, and off they went. And it's like, wow, look at that. You know, these, these are just little epiphanies and moments that you're like, oh my God, look. Yeah. You yeah. Know, hello. So soil organic matter gets a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, and a lot of my peers will call me and say, I heard you say this about soil organic matter. Can you prove it? And so I have some of those fun conversations. Um, and I'm thinking right now, some clients, uh, like more South, Southeast, um, I'll pose this in a question. Can we have a high, I think you might've alluded to this earlier. Can we have a high soil organic matter, but still an unproductive, unhealthy soil? Yes. How? Well, unproductive, unhealthy, hard, hard to say. When I was a grad in grad school and I had a chance to go to Alaska and like, and my uncle's friend flew me into the interior of Alaska because he had a plane that had floats on it. And we flew for a couple hours in the interior of Alaska. He said, where do you want to land? I said, right there. So he landed us on this water and I jumped out like an idiot dork. I went out and pulled soil samples from the tundra. <laughs> Took those all the way back to Texas, put them in the lab. The organic matter content was like 40%. No. <laughs> yeah, it was 42%. The respiration was 25 part per million. Mm. So now the water extractable organic carbon was like, I don't know, 2000. So by definition, that would be a very healthy yeah. soil, right? Yeah. Because it's got high organic matter, it's got high water extractable organic carbon. You know, it had high organic nitrogen, all that stuff, but it didn't have the engine to drive that system. Which is too damn old there, too which, long, which, which is, is the micro. Okay. So, and, and, and hence the reason that uh, the respiration was so low. We've also seen soils that had really good organic matter, six, seven, eight, nine percent. Microbial activity is crap you know, 10 or less. And you look across there and it's like the sodium is 2000 part per million. Yeah. Oh, and that's the fun part about, about this. When we look at organic matter, when you get your results back and you see organic matter, you can look at that. And the first thing I do is look at respiration. It's like, you know, how, how is this lining up? And if there's high organic matter, or low respiration, something's wrong. Yes. And then you look through the rest of it to figure out what that is and try to make a correction. So so now we have a diagnostic tool to tell us what this system looks like, how our management's impacting, and how our management can help it, not hinder it. And so that that's a that's a game changer to me when we have letting, you know, kind of like the soil talker concept. Let the soil talk to you. Let's not just take the soil and take it in the lab and, you know, torture it and, and threaten it to give us the numbers we want. Oh, and one last thing I, before I forget. Back in the day when soil testing was in its infancy, they were trying to use water extracts. The reason they got away from water extracts, they didn't have instruments that were sensitive enough to detect much of anything in a water extract. <laughs> that sounds, sounds familiar. No, that's right. And, and, and so, you know, they started developing stronger and stronger acids to rip out more and more. So they, so they went with the idea of more is better. Yeah. The more you rip out, the more accurate it is. And that's just not really the case. It's like when we used to build engines. You know, you put the biggest damn camshaft in it, but the rest of it didn't work. You had low compression and the wrong heads and, you know, 
but you had a big cam and you know the engine didn't actually run with the shit. It sounded good idling, but it didn't run with the shit. So <laughs> the whole thing has got to work together and be balanced. Yeah, there's a lot of checks and balances on it. I'll get a client who will call me and they'll say, hey, I don't understand this. This is high, usually so organic matter. pH is fine, but why is the soil health calculation suck? And when you start going through all those, it makes more sense. But I would, I would come back to somewhat what Joe was saying in that soil biology is the driver. And when I started this, I, you know, I was talking to clients and friends like Joe. I would say, listen, we just need to go out there and before we do something, say, are, are we feeding the microbes? Is this the best thing for the microbes? And we're going to feed more nutrient-dense food to whitetails, turkeys, etc. The entire food chain, food web is going to blow up. Let's just focus on soil biology. And that's I think that's why Joe hasn't soil tested because he's like, I don't have a need to soil test. I don't have insect infestation. I don't have diseases. I don't have plants that look like there's some sort of missing link in the fertility program. I just have biology and everything I do does, does its best to promote life, period. And I know that sounds well, cliche and, you know. Uh, and if he's using some of your mixes, he's also open to pharmacy. Yes, exactly. Right? I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that conversation with Fred. You know, it's like, yeah. And you about, you know, deer can't go to the local pharmacy and get what's ailing. They got to go find it in a plant. Yeah. That podcast, by the way, still represents number one for me all time. Not, not just personally, yeah. but at, from a unique download, that podcast blew, blew up, continues perpetually to be downloaded and listened to and re-listened to. And I remember Fred, Fred was kind of like, you know, if they made posters of Fred like they do Michael Jordan, I'd, I'd have it on my wall. His work to me was mind blowing because he ventured as a, I guess, an academic into an area that academics don't venture in because they don't have the genetic makeup to do it, which is just observe. And like you said, like with Joe's situation, they would they would ask, well, where's you know where's the peer reviewed randomly replicated science that proves that Joe's mother-in-law is incorrect, right? And there's a time and a place for that. But that pod, I, I remember stressing out about that podcast because I wanted to cover so much but respect his time. And there was so much I wanted to ask and cover that I didn't know how to run that podcast. And it, 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 I listened to it myself from time to time because it, it, it generally encapsulates this whole thing that we've attempted to do joe since we started i think and yes if we focus on the biology we get to that point now i know the academicians are, are asking and then and, you know i think mississippi state's gonna lead the way in this um that yeah nutrient density is better where there's a microbial microbial uh explosion in these soils, in, in that number six that you're talking about, I guarantee you, I know you're still in your mind, you had a point to prove at hole number six or plot number six because the mother in law said nothing will grow. Um, that was, I, a, that was a challenge, exactly. <laughs> and Gauntlet. I just discount mine when she talks, so I'll, I'll give you credit there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I love her to death. I know that you're in regen mode and you're in, in, in rehab mode and restoration. And you were like, hey, listen, I killed deer at other spots or watched deer at other locations. I'm just going to rebuild this. But I guarantee you, if you hunted that stand, you would your observation rates would be 110 fold what the standard observation rate is in the state of Pennsylvania or in your county. Or in the United States, period, guaranteed. And that could be any metric. That could be mature bucks, immature buck sightings per hour, whatever you want to look at, sex ratio. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, and the fact that you have not tested, I think it's going to be cool, though, next season when you do test, growing season, and we can look at those major metrics for those who want to see it on paper. 
and you can say, okay, here's what we've done with whatever metric you look at, soil health calculation or WEAC or whatever. It doesn't matter. Or depth, depth analysis, the new one. Exactly. Or you start to go deeper than the zero to five or zero to six inches. Oh, wait, there's a, you can go deeper than that and grow stuff. <laughs> well, we've been doing this. We're, we've been, Region Ag Lab's offering a zero to six, six to 12. You take separate samples in the same hole and boy, you yeah. talk about eye opening. It's a deeper dive in, into what, how, how your management has impacted that soil. That, yeah, I remember you did. You you told me to send some in, and uh, yep. and I paid for it. And you called me up, and you're like, "Well, good news and bad news is this one fails. You suck here, but <laughs> these other two, whatever you're doing there, are right." And I was like, "Okay, there's there's another you know tweak, another way to steer the ship. I know what's going on there, but that blew my mind that there was so much you could see in that six to twelve. Again, asking nature to show us not. Let's get it in there and make it do what we want in the lab. That's not that's not the way. We're yeah. not building computers here. Yeah, yeah. And I think what what ultimately got me to hit to to how do I say this to to work with nature is when we developed the soil talker and the ST one. And here's another plug. Um, <laughs> and and those of you in food plotting know, actually, most agricultural people who call me every day or email me, I say, I don't think you need this. And then, you know, a percentage of them come back and buy it anyway, and some of them don't. Um, but when I can take a handheld instrument in the field with me and get down on the ground and find out what those microbes, as you once said, you're listening to the heartbeat of the earth with CO2 what those microbes think about that management at that particular time that that to me is is cool i'll never forget we, we i think we had this technology for two or three years now and it's 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 patent protected at this point and i sent as we do i sent you a text or facetimed you and i'm like look at this stand would you perfect squatch habitat 12 to 15 feet tall um i let it mature because it was pumping so much through the the soil environment that I just, I was struggling in August to, um, or in July to, to crimp it or plan right into it. I just, I'm like, man, I, I put all that into it. It's thriving. And I said, I don't know what to do. Should I plant green into this thing or should I crimp and then plant? And you were like, and, and Kleinschmidt's funny. Kleinschmidt said the same thing. He runs around this country with a, a soil talker unit. He's like, uh, Aren't you the developer of a tool where you can ask the microbes what they think? And I was like, oh, shit, good point. Stuck a tube in each side, gave it like 24 hours. Went out there and roller crimped one because I'm so cool and important. I have to have the crimper on the front and drill on the back and hurry up so I can get out there and drink my Moscow Mule and did the one single pass. And then uh, just planted green right into the other one. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I just absolutely leg swept this one that I crimped and drilled. I was just explaining this to a client, uh, yesterday. And the one I planted green into was hit our, so that particular sensor in that unit, uh, as Rick knows, maxes out at 10,000 parts per million and it hit 10,000 parts per million. It's the first time I ever hit 10,000 parts per million on my farm. I was usually in the six to 8,000 on my better, uh, better fields. And by the way, my conventional neighbor who is, is, is looked at as the county's best and largest farmer, his fields are right around a thousand. Sometimes he hits 1100, sometimes 1200, depending on the time of year and the rainfall and whatever. Um, and mine were at six to 8,000 rocketed it up to 10,000, hit that ceiling plateau. Damn it. Now I'm curious. Is it 11,000? Is it 10,001 or is it 15,000? So obviously Rick, we now have a more robust sensor for people who get it and have gotten to that point. But that was the day I realized, holy cow, I can use this tool to make a decision in the field. And thanks to Kleinschmidt, he was like, uh, this is your technology, dude. You, I don't know why you guys aren't pushing this more. Rick, as you know, we're just kind of having fun with it right now, helping real farmers. Um, so yeah, to me, 
that that was like wow this this is a biological I, i'm i'm kind of slow sometimes but to be able to lay there in the field and go okay you almost made the wrong not that it was a wrong decision but you almost made a decision that was counterproductive to what your goals are for this field and counterintuitive as well i guess so yeah that's cool that's that <laughs> you guys you guys hung up <laughs> no i'm here hang up i know you guys are texting each other like hey he told us to hang up when we get bored let's hang up <laughs> <laughs> so anyway I know uh, well there's a tequila, tequila had kicked in yet yeah. Yeah. yeah actually it is getting close to that time joe we both have appointments joe said hey i have an i do have an appointment today at i don't know 11 30 or something and 11:30. i was like 11 30 yeah, yeah yeah me too with a with a moscow mule i don't know why that's been my my theme lately um <laughs> I guess for Russia. I don't know. Damn Russians. So what else, guys? I have one question. And this is coming from a non-scientist person. So you were talking about, Rick, you were talking about pH and uh, inheriting soil and plants change the uh, rhizosome. So I have a question. Um, does the sun... And this might be a stupid question. Does the sun have anything to do with the pH in the soil? And I'm I'm going back and I'll give you an example. If say if one of my say one of my plots has more sun on one side, gets more sun on one side than the other. And um will will that affect the pH in the side that doesn't get the sun? Or doesn't it matter? I don't know the answer to that question. I I don't know. That's an interesting question because you know, since plants drive or sun, the sun drives plants that drive you know everything in the soil. Right. I've never heard Rick say. Would, I don't know. You would think that the side that has the sun uh, should develop plants better, right? Which it which it does, yep. Which Correct. which could dump more chemistry into the soil than the, right. the shaded side. So you would think that the sun side would probably affect pH a little bit more than the shaded side as a gas. But you know that's I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. Jason probably knows. I do. I do. <laughs> but you'll both you'll both have to deposit more quarters for my input on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that that just goes to show. Like, I know there's some listeners going, well, uh, yeah, of course, you know, the, the plants are going to grow and photosynthesis is occurring and having chlorophyll kind of helps and we're feeding microbes. But I, I think that's a simplistic look at things. It's kind of like I, I was going to have a podcast on this, so I won't give away too much of it. But I believe, as do the the, the Japanese soil guys, you like that, Rick? You talk about the Russians yeah. all the time. Maybe that's why I'm into the Moscow mules lately because you're always saying how the Russians, Russian soil scientists for some reason at one point were like bullish on this whole CO2 and they got it. Like they were headed down the right path or whatever. Um, I'm yeah, thinking, do I have that? They, I have that? they right. were doing water. They were doing water extractable organic carbon. Yeah. 50s and 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that as you and, and I've got clients all over the country, so I've kind of watched this. And I know I've made jokes with, and we just had Trip Lightner on. I've made jokes with Trip about this. Um, as you start to treat the Earth better, and I know this might sound a little spiritual, um, and the and the the Japanese, um, a lot of the Asians t- tend to go this way. As you treat the Earth like you should, meaning. You know, I guess, and essentially the six principles, right? You're following nature's image. The rain sort of finds you. And I told my wife this a few years ago, and she's like, you're an idiot. That You're freaky. Whatever. And it's been so fun for the last five to seven years as, like, we'll leave a, a sporting event where it's, you know, beautiful out, sunny, whatever, and we get close to what I call my hill and it's, it's like, Oh crap, the the puddles in the driveway or whatever. It it rained here. Like, yep. 
and I have a theory that I, I, I use. I'll save that for later. And this is real stuff. This isn't something I made up. So it's like, it's like if you build it, they will come. But I have clients who are like in the early phases of this and they're like, gosh, man, it seems like the rain just diverts right around my fields, hits the neighbors and goes on. I'm like, that's because the neighbors are managing better than you. Maybe you need to start fixing things, right? Because the more green you put in the ground, it just makes sense. The water's going to drop where the process, the hydrologic cycle works properly through evaporation, evapotranspiration, and the whole nine yards. What do you think about that, Rick? Well, there's that uh, ranch in Mexico that that, that Ray and, and, and Gabe and them have been to several times, and, and I'll never forget, they had sent me that. It, it's a pretty big ranch. He's been doing regenerative uh ranching for a long, long time. And he's got grass, you know, and, and all around him, it's overgrazed. And, it's, and they had this thunderstorm come through there and only, and they got the radar image of it and it rained where his stuff was, you know, it, it, it almost exactly. And then stopped yep. everywhere else. Yeah. So they had created their own microclimate. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't doubt that at all. Cool stuff. All right. I yep. figured I'd, I figured I'd leave everybody on that that note so they could hear that and uh yeah all right joe you have an appointment and uh and i do too um so guys i appreciate you coming on today joe i appreciate you getting out of the out of the woods no worries hell of a hell of a sunset that'll be the last time you send me a sunset picture (laughs) oh that was sunrise or i'm sorry sun sunrise (laughs) yeah sunrise all right gentlemen anything else Joe, you got to well, go. Thank, thank you, We're guys. Good. Excellent. Yeah, have appreciate a great day. Rick, thanks for your time. Appreciate everything. You bet. All right. We'll do it again. Bye. Be safe. Thanks, Be guys. Safe. See ya. All right. I'm going to wrap it up quick because everybody has an appointment somewhere to be me with a Moscow mule. So the take home message is today just this simple microbes drive everything. So when you're trying to decide what to do in your food plots and you're out there thinking about management, um, just ask yourself, which one does the micro, do the microbes want? Which management activity do they want right now? Uh, if you don't have an ST1, maybe you do need one. I don't know. I keep telling food plotters they probably don't need them, but that's what got me to um, uh, you know, 10,000 parts per million and microbes that, are, that seem to be pretty happy with the carbon that I'm giving them. So... Thank everybody for listening, and I will have some more stuff for you here in the future. So long.